When I was a kid growing up, I knew two things. Space was cool, and so robots in space meant double cool. And that's why I'm really excited today to be talking with Rod Pyle. He's the author of the book Interplanetary Robots, True Stories of Space Exploration. And we're going to learn about what robots have taught us about space and the cosmos right now. My guest today is Rod Pyle, a space and astronomy writer, lecturer, and educator. He has a master's degree from Stanford University and a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Arts Center College of Design. He studied astronomy and geology at UCLA and worked in public outreach at the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. He's written several books, including Interplanetary Robots, True Stories of Space Exploration. And I want to lead off briefly with a quote from another astronomer who I respect and admire, and this is what he had to say about this book. He said, if machines ever replace us, they want to keep Pyle on hand to do what he does for our interplanetary <laughs> robots, personalize their stories, spotlight what's important, and explain why with wit and wonder. This book is a first-class seat on all these unmanned spacecraft. That was E.C. Krupp, director of the Griffith Observatory, and author of one of my favorite books on archaeo astronomy, Echoes of the Ancient Skies. So that's quite a compliment. Yeah, I was really thrilled to get that. I worked with Dr. Krupp for well, the better part of a decade. I say with, I worked for him. I was the, the head docent up there for a while. And uh, he was just a pleasure and really took the mission of running. You know, it's not easy to run a museum like that, especially when it's city-owned. Um, but he kept his hand firmly on the helm for decades, and they finally had this huge renovation in the early 2000s. And it's just a spectacular place if you ever get a chance to go up there. That's Griffith Observatory in L.A. I really hope to. Absolutely. And, of course, I always enjoy history and archaeology almost as much as I enjoy astronomy by itself. But when you can mix the two together, that's great. Krupp does that, and you do that with your writing. You are as much a historian to me, Rod, as you are an expert on space travel, interplanetary robots, and the like, which are the subject of your new book. You know, one thing that definitely comes to mind with this, we don't know if there's life elsewhere in our solar system, but we're certain that other worlds in our planetary neighborhood are inhabited because of the robots we've sent there. So, you know, really, what is the scope of this book and what got you interested specifically in the robotic side of space exploration? So the scope of the book, I've been accused of being a little JPL biased. That's the Jet Propulsion <laughs> Laboratory, NASA's field center on the West Coast in Southern California for robotic uh, space exploration. And I got a cop to that. You know, part of it is it's just easier to get solid material from the American program that is from the Soviet program. And we really had this second space race going on in the 1960s. There was the one we all know about, which is racing the Soviets to get to the moon before the end of that decade. But there was a secondary program in both countries to try and achieve space first with robots. And robots were not very robust back in that day. You know, there are even plans to do some of these later as as uh, missions with human crews because we were so uncertain of our robotic capabilities. But there was a really robust program in the Soviet Union. It's just a little harder to get the straight dope on some of those missions. And I also have worked up at JPL off and on over the years as a contractor writing for them. So I do have kind of a bias that way, which I admit to. And I think it was what really got me interested in the, the robotic program was – I grew up with Apollo, so I had, I had witnessed all that firsthand, and that was an incredible time to be alive, just just nothing like it. I mean, there was a period of time in the late 60s, early 70s, where these incredible missions of lunar exploration were taken off as frequently as every couple of months. Oh, yeah. And it was an amazing thing to watch. But then in 1976, the first Viking lander was going to set down on Mars, and that was huge. That was a program that had been in the making for, depending on how you parse the numbers, about 15 years at least. And um, because I live in Pasadena, California, I was able to go down to Caltech, and they weren't letting the public in the auditorium because it was a press-only event at that point. But having grown up here, I kind of knew some of the back ways in, so I snuck in there and got sort of a slightly – a scant look from some of the journalists there because I didn't have a badge. Like, eh, <laughs> this is kid. What's he doing here? But to be there for that first landing and see that first picture come back, which was not of the horizon, interestingly enough, which drew grumbles from some of the journalists. It was a, a shot of the lander's foot pad because they wanted to make sure they had set down safely on stable terrain. But to me, that was such a magic moment is this culmination of Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles of Edgar Rice Burroughs and Princes of Mars and this lore that we had inherited from uh, Percival Lowell back around the turn of the, of the 19th century of 
a, a potentially uh, life hosting planet. And although it didn't turn out to be that, and we knew that in the 60s once Mariner 4 flew past, it was still just an amazing moment to be there when that first robot set down on another planet, soft landing, incredibly successful, operated for years. And I think that's really what got me fired up about the robotic program. So I've just been a real devotee of that ever since. Yeah. I, I mean, what you're seeing right there, and you've described eloquently for us there, is watching science fiction step over into reality. And now we are actually, I mean, we haven't made it to the red planet ourselves, but we have put our technology there. And in a sense, we are already exploring, I mean, we're in every sense already exploring Mars. And to see it, you know, be lifted off of the science fiction page and enter this new era where these discoveries are becoming reality, I could see, I mean, I, I don't know how anyone could not be excited by that. And, you know, Rod, we've got a little news that's been breaking recently, although it's been really kind of a prolonged story for the last six months. Uh, over the weekend, it was reported that NASA will be making a final attempt to restore communication with the Opportunity rover there on Mars, which might have been, I think, damaged during a dust storm. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, it had been, those machines all incur a lot of wear and care because uh, wear and tear because Martian soil it's really nasty stuff. It, it hasn't rained there in, in millions, if not billions of years. And the soil is very fine-grained, a lot of sharp edges, uh, and it's, it's chemically toxic. So it's very tough on those rovers. And for opportunity to have uh, been operating like it did ever since 2004 when it set down, and it really was the, the machine that sort of wrote the history of, Mar of water on Mars. The, uh, the Curiosity rover, of course, famously was able to drill and discover the, the detailed history of water in Gale Crater, where it landed. But it was Opportunity that first discovered those little blackberries, those little concretions of hematite that were left in, in various strata around different parts of the planet where it traveled. It drove for 30 miles almost, really just charted this history of water on the planet at a time when we really didn't understand what had happened to the water and how much there was. So between that machine and the orbiters, we built up this sort of detective-based history. A lot of it's by inference, and they're very clever about that oh, at, yeah. at JPL and NASA and large, of the fact that this was once a very wet planet and that there's enough water locked up in ice around the world to cover it something like a, a, a level of about 30 feet of ocean. So that was really the amazing thing about Opportunity and the, the uh, MER rovers in general. Sadly, uh, what happened was we had a global uh, Mars dust storm, which happens every few years. Um, started in May of last year, went on for a couple of months. And unlike the Mars 2020 rover, which has a nuclear fuel supply, the uh, Opportunity was powered by solar panels. And it just got so dark for so long, the batteries ran down. Apparently, the heaters may have finally run out of power and it just couldn't withstand as far as we can tell the uh sort of de facto martian night that it was subjected to for months and months so they hoped that it would reboot and spring back once it got enough solar power to charge the batteries up but it doesn't look like that happened so they set a timeline to listen and keep trying to make contact uh it was short it was going to end by the end of last year and there was a lot of pushback from the science community understandably people that have been associated with this program for decades so they extended it, but at a certain point, you just have to give up and say, okay, the mission's over. Mm. We did a great job. It fulfilled. I mean, it was only supposed to last a few months. Right. So, <laughs> you know, it's well beyond its warranty already. So yeah. That was sensational. Had a pretty good run, but who knows? I mean, they're, they're going to try one last time, as I understand it. So uh, we have high hopes. We'll see what happens. Now, Opportunity was sent up there in 2004. It's, of course, not the only artificial object on Mars. In fact, I think there's at least 15 of them, if we count all of ours, the old Soviet uh, projects going all the way back to Mars 2. But now you were actually on hand also at JPL's Von Karman Auditorium, I believe, in 2012 when Curiosity was making its landing too, right? Yeah, what a, what an evening that was. So I'd gone up <laughs> at midday, and it was a typical hot afternoon in San Gabriel Valley in Southern California because that's what we get is heat and smog. So going into Von Karman was, uh, was always a welcome change because it's a very nice venue and it's air-conditioned, <laughs> which is the most important thing. And we were able to watch the big screen up front. They had this computer graphic up with Mars squarely in the crosshairs from the point of view of the, just looking over the shoulder of the uh, spacecraft as it was airing in there. And the thing that, that uh, some people don't know about the current crop of Mars landers is in Viking, back in the 70s, there were two spacecraft each comprised of an orbiter and a lander. 
And when they went to Mars, they went into orbit and then dallied there while they were able to look down and really use their close-up cameras, the telescopic cameras, to uh, define the best parking place you can find down the orbit, the best place to land. Um, with all the missions since then that have had landers, it's just a straight shot. It's like a hunting rifle. You, you aim it at Mar- where Mars is going to be when you get there. You shoot it. And you hope you've calculated everything correctly so it enters the atmosphere just around the edge enough to slow down with the heat shield and parachute down and land exactly in that spot within a few dozen miles either direction. So it's a really remarkable achievement. In addition, of course, for Curiosity, we had this wacko sky crane thing, which when most – I'm not an engineer, but even the engineers I know when they first saw it that were involved in the mission – we're looking at this thing, so it, it had to come down to a hover, and then it lowered the rover by these these four tethers, and then cut them loose, and the rocket pack had to go crash somewhere else. And if one of the tethers didn't separate, the rocket pack could drag the rover on its side. There are all these potential points of failure. But I had, for that previous book uh, called Curiosity, I had interviewed Rob Manning, who I've known for, I guess, about 10, 15 years now, who was the chief engineer on that mission, and now he's the chief engineer at JPL overall. And I said... You know, what were you thinking? I mean, really, is this the easiest way to do it? And he said, you know, going down like we normally do it, and like a lot of the foreign powers are still trying to do it, you put a, a, a rover on top of a lander. That's what the Chinese did with their most recent uh, lunar probe mm-hmm. that landed on the far side of the moon. You put a rover on top of a lander, it's a little bit like, like balancing a bowling ball on top of a broomstick. You know, it's it's very tippy. And then once you're down there, you've got the problem of driving off the, the, the landing stage and so forth. And he said, this is the best way and the simplest way with the fewest points of failure we can figure out to deliver this giant rover and its own wheels of the landing gear. So seeing that succeed was just breathtaking. And then, of course, seeing the jubilation of all the people involved in the mission and the, the entry, descent, and landing team as they came in later screaming and cheering and wearing their cool shirts was was just almost too much. It was great. <laughs> Absolutely. Again, history in the making, and it just goes to show how much you know there is an actual historical component to this. You do a brilliant job reporting that. We're talking with Rod Pyle, an author, and of course his latest book is Interplanetary Robots, True Stories of Space Exploration. Rod, let's talk a little about the history of space probes and roboticized space exploration. Because, again, this isn't a new concept. And basically all of our explorations of space beyond the moon have been achieved only in one of two ways. We use telescopes and equipment from here on Earth that helps us visualize what's going on deeper in space. And then there are the interplanetary robots you've written about in this book. So let's talk about that the, the concept and its history going back even earlier than some of the missions that we're talking about right now. So this really sprang to life in the 50s when we realized we we had machines that could get uh, these probes off Earth and into orbit and beyond. And the Soviets were were early into that with their shots towards the moon. And like like ours in the early days, a lot of them either went flying past the moon and missed it or smacked in the surface, sometimes by design, sometimes not. But there are a lot of failures. And back in the day, computers were very primitive. Robotics was really in its earliest stages. We had always sort of envisioned from the 1920s on the idea of these machines that walk around looking like people and smoking cigarettes and driving cars and cleaning their house and all that. And that's not how it turned out. You know, they turned out to be very function driven. But it was really those earliest days, the late 50s, early 1960s, that sort of defined the path this is all going to take. And as I mentioned earlier, at the time, there was enough concern about the lack of reliability in these machines that they were planning at one point in the U.S., and I know the Soviets had similar plans, they were planning to use uh, leftover Apollo hardware after the lunar landings to send a flyby mission with men in it, with astronauts, to sling around Venus, drop robots on the way and control them while they were flying past the planet for about 10 hours and then hope that they continue operating after we left. And that was never done, of course. Yeah. It's a good thing, because now that we know what we know about space, the radiation would have soaked those guys. But that's how uncertain they were. And it was really a lot of baby steps to get these things to be able to do what they do so well now. And the, the big twist now, <clears throat> excuse me, there are two things. One is miniaturization, and one is artificial intelligence. So when you've got something like New Horizons, that you just flew past that that target a billion miles past Pluto called Ultima Thule, you know, they're, they're something like 10 or 12 hours away from mission control one way. So that's a long, long time for a radio signal to go out and come back, and you can't control it with a joystick. So it's got to know what to do. 
But between that and making these things smaller and lighter and easier to launch and control with the advanced um, intelligence and the computers, you're really entering a whole new era of this. And they just flew a couple of CubeSats, those little things that are about half the size of a shoebox, mm -hmm. uh, along with the latest Mars Land or Mars Insight. That's the first time that those kind of devices have gone beyond Earth orbit and towards another planet. So with the success of that experiment, I think you're going to see more and more of these small, very light robots. You can launch a bunch of them with one rocket going off and really starting to reconnoiter the solar system in great detail. Yeah, which is just so fascinating. You also touch on two aspects of technology that both are fascinating to me and that are a little concerning. One is miniaturization. I mean, that's been something that's just a general trend technologically. I mean, things over time as really, I think, as far as electronic components go, you know, moving over from transistors to solid state kind of helped with miniaturization. And that's something that we see almost in all areas of technological innovation and development. Phones, televisions, everything. I mean, leaner, meaner, more efficient. Uh, generally, it is a trend towards smaller and more efficient technology. Not surprising that that's happening in space, but when you bring artificial intelligence into this, you know, there are some real interesting questions uh, on the horizon as it relates to that. And another guy that we're going to talk about a little as it relates to space programs and the privatization of space travel a little later, Elon Musk, he's very concerned about artificial intelligence. You know, what kind of applications are we seeing with, you know, really, Rod, I would call it pre-AI. It's not fully autonomous AI, but it's, right. it's definitely innovating and changing the way that space exploration occurs. How are we seeing it being implemented right now? So we're not yet looking, at least in the space program side, we're not yet looking at, at Terminators. You know, they're not <laughs> going to take over the planet anytime soon. They're not going to change their mind and head back to Earth orbit and shower us with some kind of devastating attack from above or anything. These are very basic machines. And the thing that's, in, that's interesting to me and isn't reported on that much about these, uh, these computers that are flying on these interplanetary probes, they're old. Mm -hmm. You know, they have to use chips that have been hardened against radiation because the solar system is very hostile once you leave the Earth's magnetosphere. There's a lot of radiation out there, especially as you got towards Jupiter and Saturn. The radiation is just devastating. So the chips they're using are usually at least 15 to 20 years old. So some of these designs on New Horizons, the basic chip design that they're using on that computer was uh, baselined in 1990. But it takes a long time for the military to harden these things against nuclear warfare and, and EMP bursts and so forth. And those are the chips you want to buy. And even at that, if you're buying like a power PC chip that's about 32 megahertz in speed, if you can imagine even remembering that, they're half a million, six hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand dollars for one chip. Wow. So that's why these things are used because they're hardened and they're affordable. Um, so it's really, as you say, it's very basic AI, but it's enough that they can get out there and lead these machines and do their own jobs. And even to the point that most of them now, most of the, uh, the orbiters and flyby missions that go out to the outer solar system, because they've got a fixed radio dish on them, they have to turn away from Earth to do their investigations using that dish and then turn back to Earth to transmit data back and forth, which sounds terrifying when you're that far out, but it works. <laughs> and if it has a problem reacquiring contact with Earth, it just looks for the sun and it's like, okay, Earth is back that way, and now I know where to point. And then the communication starts anew. So that's what's happening now. I also write a series of books for Jet Propulsion Laboratory with the romantic title of Technical Highlights 2018, Technical Highlights 2019. Wow. Mm -hmm. I didn't name it. I just write it. <laughs> but it's, I get to sit down with 30 or 40 of the scientists there, the principal investigators working on the newest stuff. And a number of those stories have been about their AI efforts. And one of the most interesting ones was trying to figure out when you're going to the moons around Saturn and Jupiter, and, you know, they're very far away. They've got to be able to operate on their own because of the many hours of radio signal delay, six, seven hours. Um, even, even with the current technology, a lot of it's just about the software. The software is getting so good that they're really developing these, these programs that specialize in a couple of things. One is the spacecraft not just being able to sense its condition in terms of what's working, what's not, and temperatures and likelihood of failure and all that, but being able to predict what might go wrong and then how to, as they put it, fly through failure. So if something goes wrong, it can adjust and reprogram itself to continue the mission without intervention from Earth. And that, to me, is just spellbinding. You know, that's, I mean, there's, there's technology involved in that, everything from, from cell phone programming to video games. 
And th- those are some of the people they bring in to do this programming. And they're just brilliant. So I sit in those rooms talking to those guys, you know, feeling like a poodle in terms of intelligence because <laughs> they, they're just heat radiating off their heads. They're so smart. And that's what's driving this program. The same thing's happening in other countries now. China and India famously are, are doing the same, and they're following very closely in our footsteps. In China's case, going one step beyond and just landing on the far side of the moon, which is something we contemplated but never actually pulled off. Yeah. Didn't you write, by the way, that uh, India's space probe, they were the only other nation that got it right the first time, right? Yeah, and that was the MOM mission, the Mars Orbiting Mission, also called Mangalyan, although I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. And they wanted to do, it's really an engineering mission. They wanted a proof of concept, but it was like $36 million. And our programs started about 10 times that price. And a lot of it's just the lower cost of labor. They have a huge percentage of women in the workforce on these programs because they tend to pay them less, so it's less expensive. And it's gotten to the point where JPL, I just, I was having dinner with the chief engineer the other the other night, and he said, you know, it hasn't really hit the news yet, but we're going to start outsourcing some of our assembly and fabrication to India and then flying it in partnership with them because it's just so much less expensive. So you're seeing even the offshoring of space technology now, which, you know, there's one part of me that goes, oh, it's really smart. There's another part that goes, oh, USA, <laughs> USA. But yeah. it's just globalization is, is the key to the future of this. I think privatization and globalization is what's going to carry the day, not just in human space flight, but in robotic too. But the Indians, they, they got it right the first time. It was a big, weird kind of looping orbit. But they've done some really good science, and they've got another one planned very soon, and they've got a human space flight mission planned in a couple of years, which is going to be spectacular. So they nailed it after, when you look at something like Russia, who had tried dozens of times, and got really close. But as you pointed out, they got landers there in 1971. They just didn't mm-hmm. operate for more than a few minutes. But they got really close by just trying again and again and again with this very robust technology, but just haven't quite gotten it yet. They still haven't had a success at Mars. Yeah. You may, you point out something interesting, too, though. I think Mars 2 and Mars 3 maybe were the ones that the Soviets put up there in the early 70s on Mars. They touched down, but they weren't described as being operative. You said they might have operated for a few minutes. I mean, was there at least a degree of functional operation when those probes actually made it to the Red Planet? Well, they both had orbiters and landers, so the orbiters returned some good data. The landers uh, made it to the surface. The first one crashed, so Mm -hmm. you can say it made it, but it it didn't make it successfully. Mars 3 did touch down and sent back part of one television frame showing uh, what we thought looked like part of the horizon, but it turned out it was just hash. So, again, a, (laughs) a momentary close miss, but... It just didn't quite make it. And part of the problem they had with Soviet electronics back then, because we were still very siloed between us and the Soviet Union, so there wasn't any sharing going on, was that they were fairly primitive and they were they were sequencers. So everything was set before the, the robot left Earth, and it was going to follow that procedure no matter what, to the extent that uh, one of the orbiters arrived at Mars at the same time Mariner 9 did, the American orbiter, and on the Soviet side, they arrived at the planet and it was just covered in one of these global dust storms. So it looked like a big orange billiard ball, but it did its thing because you couldn't intervene in the programming. So it went ahead and shot pictures of the planet for weeks, just staring down at the top of this dust storm, which, you know, it does give you some data on chemical composition and so forth, but it's not what you want. Whereas Mariner nine, because it was reprogrammable, JPL was able to send up command strings saying, okay, just park yourself for a few weeks. Then we'll take a look again when it clears up. So that was really one of the dividing lines, the bright lines between our program and theirs. Yeah. You know, I'm a bit of a backyard astronomer myself on any clear night in the summer months, especially when it's warm enough to be able to be outside, unlike the other night when we had that blood moon. <laughs> you know, it was I think it was 13 degrees here, and I kept stepping out my back door to watch <sighs> the eclipse. Did you get to see it? I did. I was actually, it was an interesting situation for me because I was on this webcast that Astronomers Without Borders and National Geographic mm-hmm. were doing which was really a lot of fun. So I was running, literally running back and forth from, from waiting for my interview to run outside and get a look and then run back in. And unfortunately, we got clouded out about halfway through. But it was just an amazing sight. I mean, all lunar eclipses are incredible. Solar eclipses are really incredible. Oh, yeah. And um, But that one was, was a very dark, ruddy red because the moon was so far inside the Earth's shadow that it was really just getting the very edge of the red light rays. So it was a spectacular sight. I'm sorry you missed it. 
Yeah, well, it's it's fast. Uh, actually, you know, I did get a chance to get out there despite the cold. I was able to watch it. It just wasn't comfortable. But now with the solar eclipse, there was the, the interesting uh, what they refer to as a sort of a, a ripple phenomena, which seems to be the air disturbance in the atmosphere that occurs during one of these eclipses. And NASA had put out to citizen scientists, hey, you guys be on the lookout for this. And we managed to film it, <laughs> my, my group and I. And I was so excited about this. No but, kidding. Yeah, yeah, we got to we, we actually filmed it. But Come to find out, there were dozens of other people who did a much better job filming it than I did. I was still excited <laughs> about that, <laughs> you know. Because well, there is some satisfaction in doing it yourself. Now, where did you see it from? Okay, I was here in Asheville, North Carolina. It was horribly cloudy right over my house, and I thought I was going to miss the eclipse. And I had a few friends just a few uh, miles away saying, hey, we've got full visibility here. We're in a big parking lot. Come join us. So I grabbed my camera. <laughs> Couldn't take my telescope. But then again, you don't want to look at the you know the sun through a telescope. That could be very dangerous. Uh, but we right. we managed to get out there with proper filtering equipment and eye gear, and yeah, we got to see it and film it, and yeah, the the ripple effect, which again, it looks almost like you know sand blowing across a desert during a storm or something. It was you know across the surface of the parking lot. It was clearly visible, and we did manage to film it. But again, I wasn't the only one. I'm just fascinated that there's still you know aspects of our atmosphere and its relationship to things like eclipses that you know we're still trying to get at, you know information on, and NASA. More and more seems to be outsourcing to citizen scientists, and like you said, with the globalization of space programs, they're reaching out and working in co- coordination with other countries, too. It's just a fascinating time to be alive. Hey, uh, you know, I wanted to talk to you really quickly, too, because you mentioned Saturn and, and distant moons. There's also the hope that there may actually be life on some moons and, who you know, for, for all we know, maybe even some planets elsewhere in our solar system. Uh, this brings us to the joint NASA and ESA spacecraft, Cassini-Huygens. You know, this was, again, one of these joint projects, an uh, international co- uh, collaboration. Launched in 1997, reached its destination Saturn in 2004, and orbited, uh, I think, until, was it last September that it completed its mission? Is that right? Yeah, right. They they went ahead and angled the spacecraft so it would go into Saturn's atmosphere because the fear was that between the fact that it hadn't been sterilized for planetary contact, at least for anything like a rocky moon that had water that might contain life and the plutonium on board as a fuel as a power supply, uh, it was thought that it was best to go ahead and let it do the suicide dive into Saturn. And the added benefit was those final orbits took it between the inner rings and the side of the planet as it was augering in closer and closer until it finally entered. And there's tons of good science that came from that. And I, I don't know if you saw the story just recently about the revised age of the of the planet's rings. I did. Uh, there, yeah. So there had always been this idea that well, it was probably a failed moon or just some of that solar system junk that that didn't manage to coalesce into something, or a moon that ran into something and exploded, was shattered. Uh, and that was what we thought for a long time. It was probably formed around the earliest part of the solar system. But once I got back this this new data from the Cassini mission. They're able to gauge the purity of the ice and the rings at about 99%. So, and again, this is this detective work. This just blows my mind. <laughs> so working back from that with mathematical models, they said, okay, knowing that, how long would it take that pure ice to become 1% impure? And it turns out the answer, and part of it's knowing the mass of, of that ring, it turns out the answer is about 10 to, 10 to 100 million years. They're much younger than we thought. They were forming somewhere around the time the dinosaurs went extinct. And the way they figured out the mass of that, of that ring was as a spacecraft passed between the rings of the planet, they were able to measure by the change in frequency of the radio signal, by the probe being tugged slightly towards the innermost ring, they were able to measure the mass of those rings. And that just... I saw that and I thought, God bless these people. <laughs> they are just remarkable. So that was a really cool story that came out of that. Yeah, it's remarkable indeed. Yeah, I uh, I actually found a uh, anecdotal report. This was from I think New Scientist back in 1991. But there was a scientist somewhere in Europe who had posited that he believed sometime in the last 2,800 years there may have actually been rings around Earth also. But Phil Plate over at the Bad Astronomy blog. I uh, did a really interesting piece talking about again the fact that the composition of most of these of these ring systems around planets are largely formed of ice. Earth's proximity to the sun wouldn't allow for those rings to last mm. as long, and hence why Earth doesn't have rings. I don't guess it's p- impossible that Earth may have had rings at some point, though. Have you ever looked into that? <laughs> I haven't, you know, and that I, I didn't actually see that that paper. So that's really interesting uh, deposit. And plate Phil Plate is just a an incredible resource. You know, oh, yeah. he comes out swinging with his responses to these things. 
but it's always fascinating to read and listen to what he comes up with. Yeah, he's really one of the best, in my opinion. We're talking with Rod Pyle, also one of the best, in my opinion, and his new book is Interplanetary. Oh, <laughs> yeah, your new book is Interplanetary Robots: True Stories of Space Exploration. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, sharing more information with the listeners about this, and I definitely want to encourage them to read this book because what we're talking about with Rod today, I'm sure it won't be the last time, but there's so much more that he details in this book and. Again, something I told you before we got rolling here with the interview was that you know you bring a very personal touch to the coverage of the of these stories, uh, and in addition to being an excellent communicator, I think that what I really like about your writing style, Rod, is that you present that human aspect that anybody can relate to, and it's not just the nitty gritty technical details about space travel that unfortunately I guess may be lost on the general readership. So you know, again, I think people will really enjoy that human touch you put on these interplanetary robotic missions. Well, I hope so, and and, and there's a reason that uh, that there's as many people in that story as, as there as there are. I had written about the same subjects previously in, in one way or another, because uh, I write about JPL quite a bit. And it was pointed out to me in not so gentle terms by a few people close to me that, A, I had a pro-American bias and I needed to open that up. So I worked hard to do that in this most recent book. Uh, it's just one of those unobserved self-faults, you know. And, and the other was uh, a couple of women, interestingly, said to me, you know, you don't have any people in these stories. And they said, well, they're about machines. They said, no, they're about the people that built them. And that's who we want to get to know. You know, we don't want to get to know some rover beyond a certain point. We want to know about the people that did it and their triumphs and, and shortcomings and so forth. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's a good point. And in particular, in the book Curiosity, which I wrote in 2014 about the Curiosity rover, I was gifted with being able to spend a lot of time with the uh, chief scientist on that, a gentleman named John Grotzinger over at Caltech which is about you know, four blocks from where I was living at the time, so I could stroll over there any afternoon. And he was just a, a, a real blessing. I mean, he had so many great stories to tell, very engaging. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a grad student in geophysics, so I had trouble following a little bit of it. <laughs> but it was just such a pleasure because, and he looked at me at one point and he said, you know, I get the, the feeling you're making me out to be the hero of this book, and I don't want that. I've got 500 scientists working for me. And I said, John, I understand that, but you have to understand that for those of us who love this stuff, you know, we may not have lives that are quite as engaging as yours. We're working a regular job, we're paying a mortgage, we're raising kids, we're, we're paying off our, our cars and so forth. And to be able to spend some time just standing next to you, looking over your shoulder as you do these things, you know, it's not the same for us as it is for you. For you, it's your daily job. For us, it's an adventure. And he looked at me and kind of shrugged and said, okay, I guess so. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why I try to get across these guys. Is you've been doing this for 10 years. You're soaked in it. It's your daily routine. But for us, it's a chance to really just enjoy this thrill of the moment of discovery when, you know, someday maybe you'll de- discover a dinosaur femur on Mars. And that would oh. be an incredible moment to be standing there. So that's what I really hope to share. Yeah, boy, that's, yeah, you know, the way you put that, that's just fascinating. It's like this is as close as we're going to get to real life Star Trek. And I know you've contributed in various capacities to some science fiction and television programming over the years, too. So I'm sure that, you know, you often think about that. You're meeting people who are literally authoring the history of the future. And this is very much like what eventually, I guess, we watch on television (laughs) in our science fiction. What we expect one day is that we will go to those other worlds, that we will go beyond the distance, that we will go where no man has gone before, right? Well, you know, we keep hoping, and for, for people like me, I'm 62, I grew up during the, the hottest years of the space age, and at that point, when you saw these missions going off the moon, you know, I was young, I didn't realize they were operating right at the bleeding edge of technology, and they could fail at any moment, we kind of had that general notion, but not to the extent that I do now, having studied it for decades, and it, it just felt like, well, of course, you know, in another 10 years, we'll be on Mars, and of course, another 10 years beyond that, we'll be standing on the bridge of the Enterprise D with all that mauve corduroy uh, upholstery they had and instant push-button gravity, and it'll look like a cruise ship with with phaser cannons and all that kind of thing. And it turns out that's a little harder to achieve than we thought. (laughs) So we're still looking at really roughing it as we head out to the other planets once that finally starts to happen. I'm crossing my fingers for you, Mr. Musk. Um, But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of what drives us all, I think. And certainly, as you talk to people within NASA, which is where I spent most of my time in terms of having access to space programs, 
you know, they were driven by, depending on the generation, Star Trek or Star Wars. And boy, if you want to get a good conversation going in the loudest possible terms, bring up which one's better and which one's sillier oh, yes. in the conversation at the cafeteria there. And you're <laughs> going to get a lot of opinions about why Star Wars is the real thing and Star Trek is just a poser and vice versa. But uh, yeah, that's that's the inspiration, and that's that's what we want ultimately. Yeah, you know, really quickly before we get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty as it relates to the history of space probes and their functional purpose in terms of communicating back to us what's going on out there uh, beyond Earth, our island home. Uh, I, I do want to mention, you know, I visited the London Science Museum with my dear friends Beth and Maria a few years ago, and they happened to have at that time a display. Uh, at, uh, which was open to the public, but you couldn't take pictures, and you'll know why in just a moment. It was called Cosmonauts, and they actually had some relics from the manned orbital laboratory and some of the Russian space program that, I mean, again, n knowledge of this didn't come to light for several decades, but to actually see some of those, I mean, talk about cramped. Those These were manned capsules. I mean, these little spherical... Yeah, yeah I'm sure you've seen some of this stuff, but I mean, again, so in, in your new book, you, part of what you are kind of emphasizing is the international aspect of this. And when I went to London and saw some of this, and again, they said you can't take pictures for two reasons. One, because some of this stuff is highly sensitive even to this day, and two, because we've got a book full of pictures that we want to sell you when you, go, when you get to the gift shop. But again, I, I was just fascinated with... I mean, the complexity, even going back to the 1970s, and the fact that they actually had, in various capacities for spy purposes, a functional space program. Yeah, and and then you get into looking at their attempt at the lunar landing program, which we knew we knew was going on, but we didn't know any of the details over here in the West back in the day. We just knew that there was a race afoot, and the Soviets kept saying, no, nah, we're not racing you to the moon. But at the same time, they were building their big N1 moon rocket, which tried to launch four times and failed due to engineering problems. But they had a lunar lander, and they had the Soyuz capsule, and they probably could have pulled it off with a single human on the moon. It only carried one, uh, had they not had these problems with their booster. But you look at that hardware, and the hardware on both sides is primitive, but the, but the Soviet hardware especially was really built to be basic and robust and foolproof, which is why, of course, Soyuz is still flying decades later. Um, but it's, as you saw, it's, it's kind of a, a, a sledgehammer approach to the problem, yeah. but it works. I, I mean, to the extent that for their unmanned program, the robotic program, most of the probes that went out to the other planets, to Venus and, and even to the moon and to Mars, their electronics were inside pressurized enclosures because they weren't hardened the way ours were. So rather than just flying them out in the cold vacuum of space like we did with these very robust systems, they just put it inside a miniature hull and filled it full of nitrogen gas and said, okay, that works. So if you've seen many of their unmanned machines, they're large, they're heavy, they had big rockets, that was not a problem. And they kind of look like something that's that's been taken over by a disease. You know, there's all these <laughs> globules and round shapes and big, heavy structures. But they worked, and their success on, on Venus was just brilliant. Yeah, it was just fascinating to see an entirely different approach. Because, again, at that time, due to the necessity, I mean, with the Cold War – you know, under underway. I mean, there was a necessity for secrecy, and so we weren't sharing. Well, I don't know. We we were sharing some things because I mean, even going back to the Kennedy administration, he was arguing for this joint U.S. space, uh, well, U.S. Soviet program at the time. So I mean, there's always been that international aspect to it, and that's been part of the story. But nonetheless, there was what we shared, and then there is the aspect that was kept off the books. And so we, as we look back at some of their technology and how much it differs from what our guys down there in Alabama were working on. It's really fascinating. And and speaking of, again, what we've you know done here in the U.S. over the years, I think it warrants mention that we talk about Viking because really on a list of the top, you know, NASA and, 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 and really in terms of uh, programs that we've learned so much about space uh, over time, in terms of the top 10, Space.com did a write-up. And although, of course, they put the Apollo missions at number one, uh, the, the, the first or the highest ranking probe was Viking. And it really warrants some discussion here. I think it touched down on Mars in July of 76, if memory serves. And again, it's been one of the most probably lasting moments in the history. We've, we've already touched on it a little, and you've mentioned it, but let's get into the significance of that mission and why it ranks so high on top 10 lists, You know what that meant for space exploration and the U.S. Uh, involvement in that at the time. Viking was really just a triumph. You know, it was it was the logical extension of the Mars orbiting program, which had been based on the Mariner spacecraft going back to the first shot at Venus back in, I think it was 1962, of Mariner 2. 
And so the, the orbital buses were based on Mariner. The Viking lander was a, was a design that was based somewhat on the surveyor lunar landers that had set down the moon in the mid-1960s and sort of reconnoitered that for, for the manned landings to come in a few years. But the likelihood of it working as well as it did was not high, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's why you launch twins. I mean, you launch two of each, two orbiters, two landers. And the fact that this planet, nothing had ever landed there, we had learned a lot about it from orbit, but there's only so much you can learn with that technology back then. So it was really this big jump into the unknown. And then you add to that this idea that they were so focused on life science. They really wanted to know, is there anything living there? Have we missed anything? Is this planet that looks like this absolute arid frozen desert from orbit, is there a chance there's something down there? We didn't understand, of course, the soil chemistry yet, which is highly oxidized and full of perchlorate, not very friendly to living things, as near as we could tell. So these two landers went down. They had seismometers. They had weather instruments. They had great stereo cameras. But they also had these life science labs in them that with 1960s technology, because this program was long in the making, of course, they had reduced a college classroom-sized life science lab down to something about the size of a large microwave. And they had figured out these small number of experiments that would do basic investigations. So the Vikings landed. They each had an arm and a scoop. Really ingenious arm design, by the way. Instead of the rigid folding robotic arms we have now, it was like a couple of tape measures welded along the edges. <laughs> that, that kind of spring metal. So it coiled, it rolled up onto a roller and then unrolled when it wanted to extend. But it worked very well. They'd go grab some soil and then dump it in these little funnels and go into each of these experiments. Without going into too much detail, the basic idea was, look, let's get some dirt inside these canisters. We'll heat it. We'll, we'll add some nutrients, and we'll see if the bacteria respond to that by growing, if there's any bacteria there. Um, most of them didn't work. However, there was one that did show immediate and positive results, but they went up too high too quickly and then didn't repeat well. So the thought was that we were seeing a result of soil chemistry reacting to the water that was being injected, of course, because no rain falls on Mars, as opposed to seeing life grow. But there's still some controversy over that. As recently as the late 90s, mm -hmm. there are groups doing experiments taking that same, in, uh, that same investigation package and using soil from the Atacama Desert down in uh, South America, which is extremely sterile. And they looked at it and said, you know, given all the parameters and given what we're looking at, we think there might well have been a life indication, but we just won't know until we try something similar to that, more refined, obviously, but something similar to that in a future mission. And that's part of what the Mars 2020 rover is going to try and do. It's a real astrobiology mission. Yeah, that's fascinating stuff. I even saw an article about that just a couple of years ago, if memory serves, that they were saying, you know, there there was some interesting and some mixed results that we got, you know, from the early Viking mission. And, you know, some have, have you know, left that on the table as to what that may have meant, you know, whether in terms of astrobiology, geochemically, or whatever else about the Martian soil. It's fascinating stuff. Before we get into a little discussion about the new space race, I do want to point out, of course, not all of our attempts at studying the cosmos with robotics have been completely successful. You know, in one chapter in your book, in chapter 29, you tell the story of the Galileo mission to Jupiter. It's a heck of a story. I don't know exactly what drew me to it. I just enjoyed the way you, you told that. It has to do with a particular substance that had been sitting around on a shelf for about a decade before it was used in a pivotal part of this mission. Can you tell us a little about that story? So Galileo was originally supposed to fly in the shuttle in the 80s, but the, uh, the Challenger accident, when the space shuttle Challenger blew up in 1986, waylaid that program for a number of years and slowed things down. So they had to take this already complete, completed Galileo Jupiter orbiter. And this is a big machine. It's the mm -hmm. size of a, it's larger than a, than an automotive van. You know, it's a great big, huge spacecraft and store it. So it had trundled over to the East coast to get ready for launch. And then when that was scrubbed, they drove it back to JPL and of course the government. So to save money, they just stuck it on a commercial trucking service instead of rail or a sea barge. And so it's crossing the country three, four times on the back of a flatbed truck. Well, the antenna for that spacecraft was a new design rather than most spacecraft antenna for these unmanned probes are rigid dishes. You want a nice, big, rigid dish. You can only make them as big around, obviously, as the fairing of the rock at the size of the nose cone. Mm -hmm. So they wanted something a little bigger and more flexible. So they developed this thing that looked like an umbrella. 
and worked much like an umbrella. And it worked very well in testing. And nobody realized that having that thing sit around for years and years and years, it didn't launch finally until the 90s, um, was going to be a problem. But it turns out, as near as they could tell from the investigation, so, so just the core of this is once that probe got up there, that antenna only opened partially and right. was virtually unusable. Mm -hmm. So they had to completely redesign how they went about everything using what they call a low-gain antenna, which is basically like a dial-up modem versus broadband like we have today. So it's really constrained in terms of the amount of data <laughs> it can send. And the workarounds are brilliant, as, as elaborated on in that chapter. Yeah. But uh, what turned out to be the problem was, as this, as this probe was, was trucked back and forth coast to coast, the parts of the antenna that had to unfold, which were lubricated, were rubbing as they got bounced around. It rubbed off all that lubrication, and nobody ever thought to check it. This is one of those failures of imagination that they talked about with the Apollo 1 fire, where it was just something they didn't think about. Right. And it wasn't checked before launch, at least not in that detail. So when it went up there, it started to unfold, it hung up, and they tried thousands of times to, to get it to the, by jerking it back and forth and rotating it towards the sun and letting it heat up and then rotating it in the cold, let it cool off, try these hot cold cycles or it would expand and contract and maybe move something. They tried everything and it just would not open. So the workaround was, okay, we've got this trickle of data. So instead of a of something the size of a water pipe, we're operating through a soda straw now. Mm -hmm. Let's just figure out how to compress these images, get the most important ones, and then really use our data smarts to make it work. And again, because they had a reprogrammable computer, it was a very robust and flexible design with a certain amount of AI, they were able to get back, as you know, these incredible pictures of Jupiter right. and the moons around it. So it was just a real triumph of ingenuity. That is one of the more as you know, fascinating aspects to me about space exploration. I mean, whether it's Apollo 13 and, wow, we've got a real problem. Houston, we've got a problem, as he famously said. And the workarounds right. that have to be on the spot. I mean, again, this is another highlight of the technical ingenuity and the honest genius that we see at work in our space program. I mean, this is one of the fascinating aspects of it. And that, of course, not a manned mission, fortunately, but nonetheless one where they had to try and you know make uh, uh, the silk purse out of the sow's ear, and they still managed to do it. And look at some of the imagery that we got back from that program. It's just fascinating to me. Rod, it's come up several times over the course of this discussion already. You write about it both somewhat in this book and also in Space 2.0, one of your other fine contributions. And you know that you've really arrived, I think, uh, when you can basically tell everybody, hey, you know, yeah, I've written some books, and Buzz Aldrin wrote the foreword. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. that's probably the surest sign that you have arrived. And, of course, Buzz wrote the foreword for Space 2.0, but you often are talking these days, and you've actually been predicting, I've seen this for a long time from you, uh, that there is going to be a new space race. But this one's going to be different. It's not going to be like what we've seen in the past, especially during the Cold War. We have had a lunar probe launched and landed on the moon by China, but then there's the private space programs that we're seeing. Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin and Elon Musk, as you mentioned, of course, with SpaceX. I mean, what are we looking at here in the next few decades? Uh, this has got to be an exciting time to be alive, but are you excited? Are you more apprehensive? What are your feelings about what we're seeing happen right now? Well, I've, I've been trying to characterize it. I mean, it's tempting to say new space race because of the entry of China and how, how aggressive they're being in their program. But I'm really looking at it as more of a new space age, which welcomes all comers and cooperation between government and private sector and governments all over the world, I hope. And that's something that Buzz is, is bullish on, is cooperating with China and India to make take the best aspects of all those programs and combine them into one. Um, but I think the turning point for me, and this is just, just my construct. This isn't anything, you know, that's been made official by anybody else. Sure. But I, I give a, a lot of talks to young people, and I was giving a talk to a group of uh, aerospace engineer undergraduates and graduate students a few years ago, and I was going on, I was waxing on about the Apollo program and what it was like to be alive then and seeing these missions take off every couple of months and men exploring the moon and, you know, primetime programming being interrupted so we could watch these moonwalks, at least till the public got bored. And I was going on and on about this, as I will do, as you can tell. And it was a very small group, and I saw some students down the front row crying. And I stopped, and I said, I I'm sorry, was it something I said? And this young woman looked up at me through teary eyes and said, you had no idea how lucky you were to be alive then. We've seen nothing like that. And I just froze up for a second. I thought, my God, she's right. You know, that was a real gift. And at that time, this was probably five years ago, I said what I said to a lot of those groups, which is just hold on, 
you know, you're going to get out of school right when this kicks off again and amazing things are going to be happening and there's going to be opportunities for you guys like we never saw in my day. If you didn't work for NASA or a defense contractor or university affiliate affiliated with them, you didn't have a job in space. Now it's everything from NASA and SpaceX and the United Launch Alliance and Boeing to university labs and people working in their garages because this technology is so accessible now. But that was always a forward-looking statement. Then we saw the Falcon Heavy launch in early 2018, and this is Elon Musk's assembly of three Falcon 9 rockets. He thought it was going to be simple. It turned out to be a lot harder than that, so it took five years longer than he had predicted. But this was the first launch of this mega rocket, which is the step towards having the kind of launch capability we had with the Saturn V back in the 60s and 70s. And it worked the first time. And not only did it work the first time, as a guy who's gone to a, many shuttle launches and waited around for days and sometimes weeks for the things to take off because of the complications involved, this took off right on time. Yeah. And it worked just like you predicted, except for that third stage hitting the water. But everything else worked perfectly. I thought, we've arrived. We're here. It's happening finally now. And it's happening because some rich guy said, yeah, I want to build rockets, NASA. And at first NASA said, yeah, that's a nice kid. Knock yourself out. <laughs> right. Well, now they're buying contracts from him to take stuff and soon people to the space station. So what a remarkable turnaround. And that's just, that's the tip of the iceberg. So as you mentioned, we've got him building and launching rockets and soon uh, crude capsules. We've got Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos' company, designing ever larger rockets and having success in flying his test flights. And soon he'll be sending people and masses of cargo up into suborbital and beyond orbit missions. And we've got companies like United Launch Alliance and Boeing who have said, OK, we see the ships taking place. This isn't the same the same landscape we had in the 1960s, 70s and 80s with defense buying, you know, single source rocket flights from us and so forth. We need to get aggressive. So they're developing expendables. They're developing their own space capsules. The contracts are completely different, saving money for government. They've gotten leaner and more aggressive. And it's just this wonderful new, new era for all of us. And the promise of what's available out there, once you start really using what's in the nearby solar system, you've got water ice on the moon, we think. We know there's water and other constituents, rare earth metals and so forth, and the asteroids that we can use. There's oxygen in lunar soil. So all these things, if you can go up and distill them, you can use them there. You don't have to spend $8,000 to launch a gallon of water anymore. You can just get it out there. And from that, you can get rocket fuel, breathable oxygen, drinkable water. There's metals. You can start manufacturing parts of rockets and spacecraft off-world. And this is the game change that we've been waiting for for decades. Wow, that's so exciting. You know, I almost want to quote Aldous Huxley, you know, Brave New World, but really I guess since it's not just this world, it's more like Brave New Off World. I mean, we're talking about a new era for space exploration. You do a fine job outlining how robotics plays into that with your book, Interplanetary Robots, True Stories of Space Exploration. Final thoughts here. Where do you see the future of space exploration, especially as robotics plays into this? Where do you see this going in the coming years, Rod? Well, my lens for this has evolved recently. I've become editor of a magazine called Astra, Ad Astra for a group called the National Space Society. And Congratulations. Their charter, thank you. And their charter, they're a large nonprofit, one of the largest of their kind, and their charter is Human Settlement of Space. So as I've spent time editing that magazine, reading articles from the wonderful writers we get, and just continuing to do my own work, it becomes clear that there's this sweet spot that we're that we're coming up on in the next matter of years to a decade or two of you know how to appropriately use machines to go out and pioneer where we're going to go not only are they going to go look at distant worlds but even within just the dis distance between the earth and the moon there's things that machines do more safely and better than human beings so we're going to use them increasingly to go to the moon prospect the soil figure out what we can do with it what's actually in it that we can use I mean, we kind of know that already but we'll learn more from the lunar poles and so forth and how to better utilize these substances. And then you've got another sweet spot between government agencies like NASA and the foreign government agencies and private industry like SpaceX and Boeing and Northrop Grumman and, and Blue Origin ultimately, how to best use this combination in a creative way to get us as far as we can go as quickly as we can do it without breaking the bank. And the days of programs like Apollo are long gone. We're not going to have another Kennedy moment. That was a geopolitical thing anyway between the U.S. and the Soviet Union right. more than it was science and exploration. 
But now there are other reasons to go out there. Yes, there's still great science to be done. There's places to be explored. But there's money to be made. And as we know, that's a great motivator for human beings. And it looks like the riches that we can pull down from space, both for use on Earth and there, are just immeasurable. I mean, just using solar power from orbit to send power down to Earth could displace a, a great part, if not all, of our reliance on fossil fuels within a decade if we really applied ourselves. And using these various substances I was talking about to build and fuel rockets and spacecraft to support people off Earth really is a game changer. So that's what I see happening. That's what I outlined in Space 2.0. My predictions will probably be proved vastly wrong, and I hope they are, and I hope they are proved wrong in short order. But that's, that's what I see happening, and I, I have a really rosy outlook on, on the next 10 years because there's a lot of really smart people from many, many countries that heretofore didn't have an opportunity to participate in this discussion, this adventure, are coming into the mix. And these are brilliant people. They're everywhere. I would absolutely agree. And obviously, brilliance keeps good company. So, Rod Pyle, thanks again for being our guest here on the Grayling Report podcast. 